Um, so thanks everyone for joining um, my little session on professionalizing support for open research, um, research software engineers, data stewards, and whoever else um, wants to be included. Um, my name is Patricia. I work at the uh, Digital Curation Center, which is based at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and it's pretty much like the Software Sustainability Institute, just focusing on research data activities. Um, I'm a Software Sustainability Institute Fellow, and I mainly work on the Fair Sphere project, uh, which is working on fostering fair data practices in Europe. Um, so, why have I put this session in? Um, it basically started with um, a fairly random fellowship idea. Um, I'm a librarian by background and I've spent most of my career in uh, research data related roles um, and then got basically involved in uh, attending the research uh, software engineering conference and things like that. And I just realized that there's a lot of overlap between the communities, similar challenges. Um, and I wanted to bring the communities together, but wasn't entirely sure how best to do this. Um, and collaborations workshop is definitely one of those uh, few occasions where you have some members of both communities coming together. So I thought like I'd take the opportunity. Um, as I said, I also work on the Fair Sphere project, um, who's trying to turn high um, level recommendations on um, creating um, a research culture where fair data um, plays a bigger role. And one of those recommendations that we're trying to look at is um, uh, from a high level report uh, on professionalizing data science and stewardship roles. So this is definitely something that's on the landscape and um, basically I thought like to get the conversation started, a little session at uh, the collaborations workshop would be quite nice. Um, so what are we doing in this session? Um, I'm doing the intro now. Um, I'm lucky enough to have um, two amazing speakers who volunteered to give some insights into their, um, their activities and the progress they've made so far. One of them is Simon Hattrick, who I'm super glad that he's recovered from COVID-19 enough to um, be speaking on uh, the professionalization of research software engineering for us. And after that, um, Lena Karwowskaya um, from the uh, Free University uh, in Amsterdam, I can't pronounce the Dutch title officially, um, is going to give an insight into um, data stewardship flavors um, in the Netherlands. So we have the RSE community and um, the data steward community um, giving some, some insights. And uh, the main bit is, um, should be discussion time. Um, we have quite a few people in there and in the note taking document, um, you see that I've like put up some topics that I think could potentially be discussed, but you're also um, very welcome to um, pop in the ideas that you have um, while you're listening to the talks um, and discuss those in um, potentially in breakout rooms. We are quite a few, so I think it makes sense to split um, us uh, into smaller groups for a little bit. And then we'll join back uh, for a bit of a wrap up. Um, the main thing, as I said, is this to be a conversation starter. So um, 50 minutes are, is not that much time. So if you're interested in discussing this further, if you have ideas how this could be extended to um, like a bigger event, virtually in person when we're allowed to, to do that again, any topics that you think um, you, know, you didn't get around to discussing today, there is um, a section in the note taking document also on following up. And please um, like pop ideas down there. Um, we have the opportunities through um, my SSI fellowship and the Fair Sphere program to do a little bit more of that. I just need to know if anyone's interested in taking this conversation further. 
Um, so, yep, yeah, basically, quick guide for the note-taking document. There's a general section where you can um, take notes um, from the presentations as you go. Here are the breakout rooms um, with ideas that I thought could be discussed. They might make m more sense once um, you've heard the presentations or not at all. There is space to suggest uh, another discussion topics and this can be um, copy and pasted as you see fit. We can have like a short recap um, after the talks as well. Questions, pop them down as well. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on them. As I said, follow up ideas or just who, who would like to um, get notified if I take this any further. Um, please note that down here. And um, because there's so much that we didn't manage to squeeze into the session, there's a whole lot of links and um, further reading if someone wants to follow up including job announcements. So if someone is super into uh, data stewardship after these talks and wants a job in the Netherlands, um, there are some people actually hiring. Um, so that's everything from my side. Is there, are there any questions at this stage for what we're doing? If not, I will shut up and sh stop sharing and um, let Simon take over. Okay, right. First time sharing this talk ever, so it's going to be exciting. Um, how's that looking? Sorry, was that a thumbs up? I wasn't watching. Good, it was. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you uh, for asking me to do this talk. Uh, I was asked, we were talking about the professionalization obviously of research software engineering here, but um, but I was asked to give a bit of history as well. Uh, looking at the people who are in this room, I kind of feel that that many of you will know about research software engineering, but um, <clears throat> well, I'll give you this, this um, overview anyways. So for me, it all started um, from this sort of basic concept we had when setting up the Software Sustainability Institute, that software is just fundamental to research. It's absolutely everywhere, it's ubiquitous almost. And, um, you know, it was quite, it was just being able to state that on its own um, was, was enough to get our first tranche of funding. But when we came up to our second and third tranches, we understood that we were going to have to do this a bit more scientifically. Uh, and the way that we started to look into doing that was to run a, a survey. So we ran a survey over um, <coughs> over 15 Russell Group universities, sent out 15,000 invites to this survey, ended up with about 500, just over 500 responses. Um, and most importantly, they were from a wide range of um, different researchers from different backgrounds. And, uh, and the results I'm going, to, I'm going to show to you, um, you may have seen this, if you've ever seen a presentation by me, you've seen these results before. But for those of you who have not, I'm going to display them using the time-honored way of taking colored squares and, and using the area to represent the percentages. So in the UK, we've got about 210,000 researchers. That's our base number, the sample frame that we were working from. And we found that 92% of them were using research software. <clears throat> and we said actually research software here um, and define that as any software that you use to um, generate a result which is later in, intended to appear in a publication. So this is proper software use to generate results. It's not using a browser or, or some other sort of side issue like that. And, and, but more importantly, 69% of them said that soft, the software was fundamental to their research. So without the software, no research. <clears throat> and this is basically um, the, the, the lowest number that you have to start worrying about within research. So around about 70% of everything relies on software. Great. So we back that up, and I'm not going to spend any time on these because I don't have the time. Um, but around about a third of re, uh, research funding uh, at an absolute minimum is being invested in software reliant research. And we looked at papers as well. And over the years, we saw a massive increase in the um, use of software reliant terms in papers, probably down to the, the culture change that's occurring, which is that people are seeing software as important rather than actually, actually representing an increase in the amount of software that's being um, being being used in research. 
So if you're the SSI, you're very happy because that means you can go back and you know, apply for more funding. But the, the bigger question, the one that really matters to the reliability and reproducibility of research is, well, who's, who's writing the software now? Um, we know that this isn't off the isn't mainly off the shelf packages. It's not people just using um, you know Excel or, 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 or any of those kind of things. This is people um, doing a lot of writing their own software as well. So where's that coming from? Um, back in 2012, the one thing you could see it was it was definitely not software developers because there really wasn't a career path in universities for software developers, certainly within the UK. <clears throat> what there was, there was a lot of people doing a software development role, um, but just not being called a software developer. And the majority of those fell into two, two different job categories. One of them was PhD student and the other one was postdoc. Um, and the big problem here was you've got people who are judged on the number of papers they write and the number of, and the amount of research funding they get, but they're doing the work of a software developer. So you're writing code, not papers. Um, it's brilliant if you enjoy the work, but it's not a good recipe for progressing your career. Um, there's another issue, and it's besides the point of like not being able to progress your career, and that is that many of these people don't have training. So uh, let's go back to the software survey we ran in 2014 and look at the, the amount of training people were receiving. And we found that 25% of people said that they had um, for, for programming, not for software engineering, they had um, had online, they'd attended online courses and read books. We had 29% of people saying they'd attended a course. Unfortunately, this was very early on in my um, surveying days. I'm a laser physicist by, by training. I'm certainly not a social scientist. Um, I should have asked how long those courses were, so we have no idea whether this is a one-off, you know, maybe a two-day software carpentry course, or it could have been a, you know, a 10 year residential, who knows. Um, but they had at least around about a third had attended a course. But the big number was that 46% had no training at all. And of course, they didn't mean they had no training, they were just randomly typing things into, into a computer. I mean, they had not been formally trained. So these are people who are picking stuff up from whatever they can, they can pick up on Stack Overflow on, from, from bits on the internet, trying things out until it works, or at least it appears to work. <clears throat> um, and we've been investigating this again recently, so we've been rerunning our survey um, across different universities. This is the results from one university showing uh, slightly improved question. How do you rate your software development expertise? Rated from one to five, one being beginner, five being professional. Um, and you can see that most researchers are putting themselves you know, above average, 35% is the, the, the majority response of 35% is giving researchers giving themselves four out of five. Um, but if you follow it up with another question, can you write, do you think you've had enough training to write reliable software? Suddenly two thirds of them are saying no. And that includes 15 people who that 64% who said no includes 15 people who said they were professional developers. So <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how you put those two things together, but I think the thing you can see is that you know, there, is, there is not sufficient training in, in developing software out there. Now, that brings us to the question of what's wrong with being self-taught. There are a number of very highly skilled researcher developers and research software engineers who, who have never had formal training in software engineering, they've picked it up. Um, and I'm not arguing that, that we, we have to move away from these people doing this kind of work. What I'm saying is that um, <clears throat> it's not a very efficient way of creating a, a skilled workforce to work in the 69% of research that is fundamentally reliant upon software. We need to think about training. We need to have a position in place that is, 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 is ready to do this work. Um, the other thing, which I'm also going to quickly run through this slide because I keep getting questioned, questions on it, when I do this talk is, you know, what's wrong with being self-taught and then pull a random name out and Van Gogh was self-taught. It's like, yes, but I really don't think we can just pick on a genius. Not everybody's a genius when it comes to being self-taught of these things. Right, so I'm now gonna move to the um, research software engineering spectrum, as I call it, to try and put the, put a few pins in the map about where, um, where, where our work stands. So at one end, We've got the, um, the absolute died in the wool researcher, doesn't want to touch a keyboard. All I do is do the, the, the jobs that are seen as being absolutely research. At the other end, you've got your uh, vanilla software engineer, wants a specification, will hand back some software at the end of it, does not want to get any domain knowledge at all. And then you know, up here in this blue region, we see plenty of these research and developers I was talking about, really tremendously um, skilled um, software experts, 
but they are still mainly driven by the desire to be in the research spectrum. You know, they want to be professors eventually and things like that. And then the obvious gap is right here in the middle, the research software engineer. Now, this term was actually co was coined at the 2012 Collaborations Workshop. Um, it, James Hetherington um, asked the question, what can we do to support scientific software developers in, 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 in research? Um, a group got together and the, the thing that they noticed was that we should give them a name because they don't currently have a name and without a name it's very difficult to support a group and that's where a research software engineer came from. So who knows what's going to happen after the CW20. <clears throat> because what happened after the CW12 was that we built a community of research software engineers. So this is a, a campaign that we ran through the Software Sustainability Institute. We started off getting some press out there, trying to get people interested in this idea and this concept of research software engineering. We ran a workshop um, back at the end of 2012, um, sorry, in 2013. And then uh, we found from the amount of interest that people wanted a community and we put together the Research Software Engineering Association and the growth of that was phenomenal. You know, we um, went from having a handful of people uh, when we set up um, to having actually over 1,500 members in August 2019 when the association formally wrapped up, we handed over to the society. <clears throat> so it really was grassroots uh, run um, campaign, got the numbers behind us. Then by 2016, we had the idea um, to, to run a conference because there, there seemed to be sufficient interest. This brought together, it was a UK conference, but it brought together people from 16 different countries in the first year that we ran it. Uh, and the success of that uh, was uh, really phenomenal because it made people start to see that this wasn't a UK based thing, but it was something that had to be occurring in research across the globe. <coughs> um, and people who came to the conference went off and started setting up their own, their own associations. The first one was Germany and Stefan's here. He was one of the, the founder members of that. <clears throat> and then it occurred in all these different countries. And once a concept is taken from one country and just naturally spreads to other countries, you know that it's got something behind it. You know that it's time has come. Um, and this is one of the big steps in seeing more our research software engineering positions. And, Obviously, seeing more of these positions available is the first step towards professionalization. <clears throat> there are two things that are currently happening that are helping on the professionalization front. Um, the first is the, the organization that supports RSEs has become professional. So we, we got the Society of Research Software Engineering set up last year, um, and it is now the UK's place for supporting research software engineers, and it has a long future ahead of it, funds behind it, and growing membership numbers. <clears throat> the one thing you can do to ensure that, that the future is bright is you can go to that website and sign up as a member. It costs £20 a year. I am a trustee currently, and I'm the treasurer, so I have a duty, I am duty bound to do a sales pitch at this point, but um, I, I suggest you go and do that. Um, the, the big reason for success here was that we had uh, RSE groups set up at 20 um, UK organisations and that this was the first step toward, towards the research software engineering career being taken very seriously in the UK because as these groups grew we had uh, an expansion responsibility so you had to have, take more senior staff members on and suddenly you not only had large RSE groups the biggest is 27, 23 people I think um, uh, but you also had tiers of responsibility, so you had career progression for the first time. So these people have gone from being not recognised to having careers that can progress right through, um, right up to the level of professor, in fact. Um, <clears throat> and then the other, when with that kind of growth, the big step towards professionalisation has been that um, the funders are taking us very seriously. So the universities are taking us seriously because they've seen the growth across the sector. And the funders now take us very seriously. So um, the UKRI's 10-year roadmap, which is as part of um, a, a number of us who are from the research software engineering community, was, we were invited to, to submit our plans into, into the software and skills section. And that was the first time that, that we'd seen funders going, taking on board so many research software engineers and listening to their views when planning for the strategy of you know, what's going to happen with funding over the, the following 10 years. So I'd say that we've made a, a real success on that front. 
uh, I'm already two minutes over time. So I, I'll just very, very, very quickly say one other thing. We need to take this success um, that we've seen with research software engineering and use it to professionalize other areas. And one front that we're doing that on at the moment is the REF. We found that basically a lot of submissions are made into REF. All of them are into the papers and the publications category. And we, uh, at the SSI, we launched uh, and with Patricia also, <clears throat> we launched the Hidden Ref earlier on this year, which is trying to get more people thinking about the other things that people should get recognition for um, submitting into to, uh, for com the conduct of, of research. So, sorry, I went a little bit over. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, I don't see any questions in the document. Um, I don't know if anyone has. Uh, any questions and wants to raise their hand and ask them out loud or do really quick typing. Um, if not, we can come back to that um, again after the, the second talk. Okay, uh, should I start sharing my screen? Yeah, I don't see any raised hands, so I'll pass on to Lena. Uh, uh, is it okay? Can you see my presentation? Okay, nice. We so, can see it in presenter mode though, um, with the next slide in the preview. Oh, no. How do I get rid of that? Just show it in a normal uh, mode? Um, good question. Uh, Might be your, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily mind seeing the notes in the okay, slide. Let's just, so. let's just do this. Uh, that works better. Well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so my name is Lena Karwowska and I will be talking about uh, data stewardship in the Netherlands today. Um, so just a disclaimer, uh, I discuss my person, personal impressions of the data stewardship situation. I did not do any specific research on the topic. Uh, so, if you want to read a systematic overview, there are a couple of uh, reports from the National Coordination Center linked uh, in the Google Doc, so please go there. And I see there are at least two data stewards on the call, so if I'm telling some bloody nonsense, please um, flag it in the <laughs> notes, okay? Uh, so, um, so data stu uh, da there is a role. The, um, Data, stu uh, data, uh, data steward or research data steward. Um, and there are other roles uh, like research data officer, data manager, data consultant. Uh, these roles are official. At the same time, there has there, uh, the tasks that people end up doing vary quite a lot. And uh, there is a certain understanding that the tasks lie somewhere between um, doing, uh, working on a policy, uh, actually being involved in research projects and um, uh, or organizing the data flow there, or working more on infrastructure and helping with some um, IT solutions. Uh, and this is what I'm going to demonstrate uh, with three case studies uh, from the Netherlands. So one will be from uh, Free University of Amsterdam, one will be from uh, TU Delft, and one will be from Utrecht University. So a few words about me. Uh, uh, my background is in linguistics. Uh, I did my PhD in linguistics, uh, and before I did my PhD, I was actually involved uh, uh, there is uh, projects on language documentation. So already as my, uh, as a student assistant, I actually had a data steward role in a way that I was responsible for uploading the data produced by my, by the projects where I was working into various archives. So that was quite a typical task from, for a, um, a student assistant. So after I finished my PhD in linguistics, I worked as a research data manager at Utrecht University Library. And now I work as a community manager, uh, research data management at, uh, the Free uh, at the Free University of Amsterdam, also at the library. 
So within uh, the Free University of Amst Amsterdam, the library is trying to uh, coordinate uh, the data management support for researchers. So the library uh, is there to answer the questions from researchers or the library can uh, provide a referral to various specialists and they are all uh, like the, they are on this scheme. Uh, in the center, you see um, uh, data support offices where uh, faculty affiliated research data stewards are placed. Um, so at Free University of Amsterdam, there are nine faculties and almost each of them has either has a data steward or is looking for a data steward at the moment. Mm. However, uh, if we take a closer look at what these people do, we will see that this is not a um, very homogeneous picture. Uh, so the roles of the data stewards uh, developed within the faculties and were set to according to the faculty needs and to the resources that were available. So I want to give two examples here. On the left is uh, the Faculty of Behavioral and Movement Sciences. Uh, the data steward there actually oversees all personal data. She's also a privacy champion and she is the first point of contact for any researcher who does anything with personal data. So she's there to make sure that all the research is GDPR compliant. Uh, this is a relatively small faculty. So in principle, this is overseeable and she has a full position there. Um, on the right hand is the Faculty of Sciences, which is the largest faculty at the university. It is actually approximately the half of the university. Of, of the like of the size of the university. Some people call it a university inside a university. And uh, in this faculty, the data stewardship position is filled for two days a week. So the, there are two people who uh, work there. Each of them works one day a week. And this, as they describe it themselves, uh, each of them, uh, like they are trying to answer very specific questions, such questions that the library would not be able to answer and they might provide uh, help for the department heads with uh, policy. That's all they can do given the size of the faculty and the resources they have. So uh, I already here we see that there is quite a diversity between, this, uh, between what this, the tasks people actually end up doing. So this is a picture from Utrecht University. And in Utrecht University, again, the library is trying to coordinate uh, research data management support. Uh, there are no dedicated data stewards, but the library is, uh, has a pool of data managers. So these data managers can be insourced by uh, larger data heavy research projects, part-time or full-time to work on these projects to help with the data management plans, but also to organize the workflows, or maybe even um, help with the data collection, do some cleaning and so on. Um, so these uh, centrally located data managers actually have much more involvement in the research projects than uh, some of the data stewards from the previous uh, page would have. At the same time, the, some of the faculties also have dedicated data managers, which are, uh, which are there also as a point of contact for researchers and from what I understand are involved in larger infrastructure projects. So they are helping to set, set up certain tools for the faculty. So these data managers are very much compar uh, comparable to uh, faculty data stewards at Free University of Amsterdam. Um, the last picture is uh, to Delft, and this is, uh, this is always a very beautiful example because at uh, to Delft, uh, the data stewardship was uh, organized and coordinated centrally. There was uh, funding to set this up for the whole university in 2018, if I'm right. So at that moment, uh, there were uh, all eight faculties received 
data stewards. And uh, uh, the, uh, the data steward, the tasks of the data stewards are to uh, uh, facilitate cultural shift within the university. So uh, uh, they, they actually do a lot of engagement. They are uh, points, uh, they are first point of, uh, of contact for researchers at the faculty. They can provide, uh, provide referral to specialists if needed. And uh, they do a lot of engagement work within the university and outside of, of the university. Uh, I know that um, to Delft is also hiring data managers. So this model will look, it will have some overlap with the Utrecht model I showed in the previous slide. If you are interested, look at the Google document for the job announcement. So there will be also data managers who can, who have uh, capacity to work on specific research projects. Uh, so uh, my understanding is that uh, for this dish, you need three crucial ingredients. You need someone who is ready to be a contact point for researchers uh, or to be able to pr uh, provide referral to specialists if needed and help with the data management plans. So this is what, from, from what I understand, this is what all data stewards, stewards or data managers do. Uh, other ingredients or flavors will vary depending on uh, various factors, such as if the person is located centrally or locally at the faculty, uh, the size of the faculty, um, uh, the the number of researchers there and uh, and the amount of time the person actually has to do this job. I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. Um, that was a, a a really nice introduction into. Um, I think are we clapping? Are we doing? I think this is a, a, this is the applause. Um, that was a really interesting introduction into um, basically a role that is um, professionalized or a, a, a proper job in some institutions and not so much in others and a community trying to, to figure this out at the moment. Um, We're a little bit behind um, the um, the schedule that I had in mind, like 50 minutes are really like nothing to discuss a topic, I have to um, realize. Um, so there's one question for Simon in the document. And um, while Simon asks that, maybe people could uh, use the uh, wonderful um, icons in their participant list to let me know yes or no if they want to go into breakout rooms um, and discuss for the little bit of time we have left or if that's um, a stupid idea uh, with only a few minutes left to to discuss um, so the question for simon was um, are you seeing or do you foresee an increase in the exodus from research um, into software engineering um, following the introduction of the, the um, RSE role as a proper job and associated infrastructures around that? So I think the answer to that is not really. When you, in the UK at least, if you look at research contracts, the data is available from the Higher Education Statistics Agency. Um, you find that there's around about 150,000 researchers, well, people who are on a research only research and teaching contract. Um, and when you look at jobs.ac.uk and you start trying to look at the kind of jobs that are research software engineering by looking at the kind of tasks that these people do, we're predicting there's something in the region of eight, 10,000 research software engineers. So it's not going to take a large chunk. Um, out of the, the current the number of researchers that are currently around. Um, what you're actually seeing, I think, is just people starting to get recognition for the, the job that they've always done. So, um, and I would also hope that it's possible to jump between the career of a research software engineer and a researcher, um, especially if we can get wean ourselves off having publications as the only metric that matters, um, so that people can bring skills from 
that they picked up in, in a research role to a research software engineering role and vice versa. I think they can coexist. Right, there's someone typing a second question. So while that's ongoing, um, the majority or the few people that uh, have given feedback. Oh, Louise. I was just going to say, my typing is not very fast. So shall I just ask it? Yeah, sure. If you want to Simon. So I guess this is a sort of personal question. So have you seen any progress in career progression for people who are RSEs, but are embedded in a research group and have a more sort of towards the research end yeah. rather than being in a group that's that's a really difficult one because we've been so far been focusing a lot on on research software engineering groups because they've created this career path progression themselves and we're trying to get universities to to listen to the fact that that you know research research software engineers who are embedded in projects which is the vast majority of them um need need that kind of career progression too so no i don't have any evidence on that yet i'm waiting for the next the survey the research software engineering survey runs every two years and this next one the one that runs in september this year is going to be really interesting because it's the first one that's taken place after the this big boom in the growth of research software engineering groups which have got the career paths into at least they may not, might not be absolutely cast iron parts of the university, but they're no longer something that's distasteful to universities. Um, and I'm hoping to see that more um, research embedded RSEs will, have, will see progression through that route because the university is now open to it. But I don't have any data on it yet, no. Sorry, <laughs> I wish I did. Carlos, was there a hand to ask something? Um, uh, so yes, uh, actually kind of a follow-up question, because you, you mentioned that uh, in, uh, to the universities is becoming uh, less of a distasteful thing to have uh, research software engineers as career titles. Uh, but is there a standardized career title or even better a career path for software engineers that is applicable for all universities in the UK? So not really, but there's nothing, there's very little that is uniform across all universities in the UK. There's very little that's uniform across any two universities in the UK. Um, so I think maybe that might be asking a bit too much of the universities. Um, what we are seeing is that people are sharing job descriptions and agreeing generally on you know, what, what a research software engineer does at each stage in their career and, and, and that relates to each salary point. Um, so we're seeing sharing of that, but no, there's not a, and I guess the other thing is that, you know, research software engineers, that does the title is the title that is seeing the big growth at the moment, but there are still universities of Glasgow recently um, put a career path together for software engineer instead. Um, and it's basically when you look at the work that that, that that group, those people in Glasgow are doing, it is research software, what we would call research software engineering, but I'm not too churlish about people choosing different titles, as long as they're doing the work and they're getting um, the support that they require from the university and they're getting the pay and the, the, the sort of the proper contracts and things like that. I don't really care what they're called. And thank you. That's just me. Yes. I see Lena is raising her hand, but maybe um, you, you can make your comment um, after Martin um, asks, asks his question because there is one for you. Um, Martin, do you want to read it out loud yourself or shall I just do that for you? Uh, I, I'm happy to, to read it. I, I, I said that I'd be interested in it. Well, first of all, I said I thanked Lena for her overview and it was interesting to get an insight into not one but two uh, and, and in fact three universities uh, in the Netherlands and, and the different models that are in place to, um, to kind of integrate um, the uh, research data conversation but one of the things that we're looking at at Edinburgh is not just integrating research data which is complicated enough on its own but to kind of de demolish and, and work between the silos um, of uh, research data, research publications, um, research information systems, uh, then there's uh, contracts and, and the legal department and um, GDPR um, specialists all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, the university that I work in is from it dates back to the 16th century, so they've had f not quite 500 years to make things extremely complicated. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, so this is what I'm actually struggling with in my current role. I'm a community manager, data manager, data for RDM, for data management. And yes. uh, when I wrote strategy of what I want to do, I said, well, our goal is a community where we work towards uh, fair data, open science. So, you know, what? But basically I put all these things together and there and I was told no 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 you just do the data thing and let the open science coordinator do his own job and uh, I, I, if you have an idea on how to <laughs> break this mindset I, I would be very grateful because to me it feels absurd that good data management doesn't live in a separate world from uh, uh, open science and open access this is uh, ridiculous and I, I think it's also very <laughs> so I'm a creator I'm creating a community for data management and next to me a person is creating a community uh, I don't know for open access like that's that that doesn't make any sense so I think a good like a well coordinated uh, community community management is really needed but first we somehow need to explain the higher ups that they are looking at ex exactly the same thing just from the different angles yeah the, the, the approach that i've tried to take is to encourage people not to think in to, in in too closely defined terms you know um people would say what is research data and we would spend a lot of time defining exactly what it was you know factual and uh, subjective information um all this kind of stuff and i said no okay it's just anything that helps validate a research conclusion or is necessary for validating a research conclusion. So that's code as well. Um, or anything that enriches the understanding of the research process. So that could incorporate grey literature and things like that. So if it's in, in the harder sciences, it's easier to do reproducibility or it's possible to do reproducibility. Um, but in the arts and humanities, it isn't. But what you can get is more of an understanding of the, uh, of the context and the work that was done and it enriches your understanding of the conclusions. So uh, w one of my projects has been to blur those boundaries, uh, to, to blur those definitions and deliberately not say, okay, it's spreadsheets, it's databases, it's video, it's text, it's this, it's that, it's whatever it takes. Um, and, and, and as we do that, we're quite, for, sorry for taking up so much time, we're quite fortunate in Edinburgh that uh, scholarly communications, which handles open access publishing, uh, research data and research information systems are all part of what's called library research support. So we're all colleagues within the library. Now we have to do lots and lots of um, outreach and advocacy and handholding with the, the with the departments and with the individual researchers. Um, but what we haven't got um, f figured out quite yet to expand that into a university-wide approach to open research or open science, as most of Europe knows it. Thank you. Um... Simon said, like, um, that's the mid-level administration that makes things difficult, so go straight to the top to have that fixed there, which I think is a, a really good tip if you can get to the top. We have three minutes left. Yasmin wanted to um, comment, and I'll let her do that in a second. I just wanted to um, thank those who've put their name down for a follow-up. Apologies that we didn't get to a proper discussion. Um, the, one of the topics that um, I... I you know, I had down there was like, are there any institutions where you're already collaborating between the research software engineering team and the more data like teams so if anyone um, has like good case study there that they want to share pop your name down down there. Um, I, I would love to follow up and and actually learn about those things. Um, same, I think like mainly like put your name down to the topics that you would have loved to discuss with a little note what you you know would have said if we had time to do that um, I was talking for almost a bit too long now so Yasmin go and shoot in the remaining time okay thanks so thank you very much and regarding how research software engineers and data stewards uh, interact with each other maybe we might be able to in a couple of months time uh, give more information because state of is also starting to hire a central pool of research software engineers and I'm a data steward, sorry for not uh, explaining that first from state of so the thing I wanted to say in our case although our names are data stewards many times we are giving a lot of advice about research software 
we are uh, delivering software carpentry workshops. We are the, in the faculties also, we are the first point of contact uh, many times for questions regarding open access. So the name could be Data Steward, but we are already doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, about uh, other open science practices. Also, some of our data stewards are quite engaged with the open hardware efforts as well. The thing I just wanted to say what helps here is that we have a coordinator, so probably you know, Marta Tepereck, that helps a lot because she's also overseeing all the uh, links to be made with the ones that Martin mentioned, like uh, communicating with the legal departments, with uh, ICT departments, with all sorts of other departments. So what I would say is that for any institute who would want to have data series, it really helps a lot to have a coordinator to oversee all of the efforts. And I don't want to steal more time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. I think this like this worked way better than I could have imagined. There are names down, people who would love to follow up. Um, so um, I'll take that on and um, see how we can um, find some time to do this as a proper discussion and not um, well, not that this wasn't a proper discussion. So sorry, uh, didn't want to to. Um, play this down. It was a really good discussion just in very little time and I think it's worth following up with uh, uh, with a bit more time uh, and to dig into uh, those things a little bit deeper. Thank you so much. Thank you for Yo and um, Claire for being a wonderful back office and um, recording this hopefully so everyone who couldn't uh, attend today I hope they um, can follow up. Thank you to my wonderful speakers who did this like after um, illness last minute. So thank you, Simon. Um, and um, I think we have a little bit time to uh, get back into the main room for prize announcement and the really exciting stuff uh, and getting ready for the hack days. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. And see you in the main room in a second. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Bye-bye.